We are pleased to have David Erickson from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. He is a true thought leader in the field of community investment in housing and health. In his job as Director of Community Development at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, David is focused on investable opportunities that benefit low-income communities. His resume is full, chock full, of really impressive achievements, including launching the Federal Reserve Journal Community Development Investment Review, leading a collaboration between the Federal Reserve and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to bring together the health and community development fields, and he is the author of numerous books, articles, other publications, all focused on community development um, and healthy communities. So please join me in welcoming David Erickson. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I guess, and I, 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 congratulations on finding this, by the way. I guess everything's bigger in Texas. I didn't realize there'd be 12 uh, conferences between us and this room, but uh, I was lost for a while. Um, well, uh, this is very exciting to be here. Uh, I uh, want to just give a special thanks to my colleagues at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Some people always ask when you go to a health and housing conference or, or an anti-poverty conference, why is the Federal Reserve here? You know. Um, and many of you may not know, but the Federal Reserve has a community development function that really is dedicated to improving the, the, the economic lives of low-income families and low-income neighborhoods across the country, and we have that, those offices in our reserve banks all across the country. Um, and I don't know how many of you have ever been to uh, a conference that was co-sponsored by the Federal Reserve, a, an organization dedicated to the health of children, and a housing organization, but that's, that's a pretty awesome uh, uh, development here. And I should tell you that um, we, w the first time we had a conference of this type uh, was in Washington, D.C. in July at our headquarters, the Board of Governors, in July of 2010. And uh, since then, we've had 35 of these conferences that the Federal Reserve has co-sponsored. So um, this is really turning into something of a movement, I think. Um, and, and in part, that's because when we start those conferences, what often we'll do is we'll do these heat maps that are um, uh, trying to show, it, 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 in the communities where, where we land, we sort of try to say, okay, for those of you who do community development and anti-poverty work and community investment, um, here are the neighborhoods that light up when we think about things like overcrowding in housing, uh, poverty, unemployment, areas like, th things that we care about in community development. Uh, and then we do the heat maps that we think will resonate with the, with the health sector. So we'll do uh, prevalence of childhood obesity or other chronic diseases or violence or asthma. And what you see are certain neighborhoods light up. And in every place, everywhere we go, those are the same neighborhoods, right? Um, and so it's really imperative that we uh, work together because we're working side by side in these communities and not coordinating. And so that's a real problem. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, I, uh, I want to start with a couple framing questions, uh, concepts though, before I jump into my talk. And, and um, one of them is that I think if we get this right, if we really do create an, 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 an um, uh, intervention in low-income communities across the country that really targets the upstream social determinants of health and so that people really feel a sense of control over their future, they really feel like they have an opportunity to better their lives and improve their children's lives, uh, that they have access to job, transportation, good schools, the things that help us all become viable people, that there's a value proposition there. Uh, and, and, and I have three quotes that I want to sort of go through where I think really sort of captures that value proposition. Something that I often refer to as the market that values health, that's a kind of a controversial term, but um, I'll, I'll try to explain it a little more fully uh, in a moment. But the first one comes from our, our president uh, of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, John Williams, a macroeconomist. This is not a touchy-feely guy. He's a mathematician, he plays a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. He is, the, you know, <laughs> he is not a social activist in any way. But you can see he talks about communities being like a Jenga tower. And if you pull out one piece, like you lose jobs or you lose transportation, et cetera, you, um, the whole tower comes down, right? And he said, you know, he really sort of outlined the macroeconomics of it, because here's a guy who really cares about data. And, and I'll tell you, we, had, we went through a lot of fact checking to get these numbers right. Uh, so the numbers are $3 trillion are spent a year in medical care cost. 80% of that is spent on chronic disease. Most chronic disease is avoidable. Most chronic disease that's avoidable is generated in low-income neighborhoods. So that's the value proposition. Trillion dollars is on the table. 
Now, he was followed by the president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, Risa Lavizo Mori, and she's here, it, she's a physician, right? And she followed this, they were doing back-to-back -back uh, discussions with a, a bankers conference in Los Angeles, 1,500 bankers in the room, and she said, you might be surprised that a physician who runs the world's largest foundation dedicated to improving health is talking to a room full of bankers, but I'm here to tell you that those of you who invest in low-income neighborhoods are the most important health workers of our time. And you could, in these, and the bankers aren't really touchy-feely folks either, but you can sort of be like, oh, wow, you know, my mom always wanted me to be a doctor, you know, so <laughs> they were very excited about that. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, uh, the, there's a group called the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, a, a community development corporation in, in Oakland, uh, had a conference, a healthy communities conference that was a spin-off of a conference like this. And uh, that they, they hosted, and the uh, representative from Kaiser Permanente came, and he was, Kaiser Permanente is a, is a huge medical care provider, but also a health insurer, they're both, it's an HMO model, right? And he basically said to this group, the room full like this, filled with community-based organizations, and he says, it behooves us not to work with you, community-based organizations, to prove the upstream social determinants of health for our policyholders. And, and the observation was, he said, look, medical care is my one intervention to improve health uh, for my policyholders, and it only influences, and I'll show you this um, uh, Michael McGinnis uh, uh, char pie chart in a moment, but he said t medical care only influences about 20% of the outcome of someone's health over their life course. So here's, a, here's somebody from a health insurer saying, I need to talk to you, uh, affordable housing developers and community-based organizations and education organizations, because you're the ones who really influence health. So that's this big, that's a really important concept. That's where, this is the value proposition of do, you guys doing the work that you're doing. The second thing I wanna say is this, is, this is a book I wrote many years ago on the history of community development and, and the affordable housing policy uh, uh, work. And it, uh, Urban Institute published it. I think it, I, I think it sold about six copies, five of which my mother bought. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it try to, what we're trying to capture here is this sort of, the, the community development movement is something that came out of the 1960s, and the first community development corporation, where, where we get our name, is um, the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation in New York City. And, it, and the idea here was that local communities needed corporations in order to sort of chart their own economic destiny. Um, and that movement started with that one, uh, Bobby Kennedy was really instrumental in sort of getting that one off the ground. Now there are 4,000 across the country, many really high quality ones all across the country. Uh, one of the best in the country and in the history of community development is Foundation Communities, who is a hometown hero here. Um, so you have groups like Foundation Communities across the country, and they are in partnership with banks that really care about um, investing in a way to meet their Community Reinvestment Act obligations. That is about $200 billion a year. It's a lot of money. Um, they also uh, are in partnership with community development financial institutions. These are nonprofit banks that work with banks to help sort of find more um, nuanced and boutique sort of uh, financing solutions for some of these hard to finance projects uh, around the country. Um, you have intermediaries like LISC and Enterprise and NeighborWorks America who are very instrumental in sort of building capacity and technical assistance to this network of players across the country. Um, and then you have, you have partners at the federal, state, and local level. I hope we still have partners at the federal level. We'll see how, that, how things go. But um, at least state and local, they're, they're here for a while. And so, um, so we're going to see um, this, this industry is massive. And, and one of the things, and the reason I, I, I want this to be the second sort of framing concept before I get into the, the rest of these comments is that what's interesting about this effort at doing anti-poverty work and urban revitalization is it used to be the case that when liberals were in power, there was a certain uh, approach to affordable housing and, and urban development, and when conservatives were in power, that was usually um, dismantled, and then liberals would be in power again, and it would be reestablished, and then then, and then broken down again, et cetera, et cetera, right? It would go through this kind of boom and bust cycle. That has not been the case for community development for the last 40 years. It has been a steadily um, increasing, uh, both in terms of financing and sophistication, and uh, it, has, it has something that I write in the book I, that I call pan-partisanship. Um, and so because it is a public-private partnership that does borrow 
um, from all different sectors. It often runs, there, there, there are investment tax credits that are sold, uh, the low income housing tax credit, the new markets tax credit, to corporations. And so in many cases, conservatives see this as a tax break to corporations, and they like that. Um, and then there's sort of um, moderate conservatives, like a, like a Jack Kemp, who really sort of see this as a way in which uh, you're using markets to solve social problems. So you're not he, he, passionate about solving social problems, but, but not, doesn't trust the government to do it. Um, then you have moderate uh, liberals who kind of look at this as ways in which you can um, sort of, uh, again, use the market to solve social problems. And then finally, you have uh, the far left who see this as a community empowerment problem, uh, issue where you're empowering local networks in order to sort of solve social problems. So, so what's interesting is across the spectrum, this, this pro program has been popular for 40 years. It is going to continue to be popular. And so I think partnering with this sector is going to be really important for those of you who are really thinking about sort of how do you improve low-income areas in, in your area because uh, I think th this, this sector is not going away. Uh, okay, so I, I want to put this in con some historical context. My PhD is in U.S. history, and I often think in these terms, and I think if you want to think about what do you do about cross-sector, place-based efforts that target the upstream social determinants of health, I think the first effort at this was the war on poverty uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and what you had was, uh, uh, that was followed by a period of inaction, but by the 1980s, by the 1990s, there was a second wave of this effort at sort of um, what was then called comprehensive community development, where people who did health, education, uh, public safety, affordable housing, uh, started trying to come up with different plans. You can think about the neighborhoods in bloom. Uh, Annie Casey Foundation did a lot of this work. Uh, and there were some uh, bottom-up efforts. Uh, uh, also, uh, the Dudley Street uh, Initiative, for example, in Boston was of, of this type. Um, and, and the area we're in now, the sort of the 3.0, is this kind of collective impact. This, uh, who, who here has ever heard of collective impact? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, right? These guys, they have done a good job of marketing that concept, right? So collective impact is this sort of the 3.0. I think there's a 4.0 version that we need to start working on, and that's this market that values social outcomes, and I'll get to that in one second. So here's my summary of uh, social policy and urban, re, uh, urban development policy over the last 50 years. And I guess what, you know, what I'm trying to get at here is this... What you have here is um, that that's the first, that's 1.0. That's the war on poverty. Um, when you read the reports from that era, and I read a lot of them as I was writing that book, uh, they sing, they're so eloquent, they're so, they sound as though they could be written yesterday. I mean, you start, say, you know, they start off this, you know, social exclusion is the product of many overlapping social exclusions, and the response requires a very nuanced and intricate, you know, I mean, they just go on and on like that. I mean, it's just, you just sit there and you think, God, these guys are geniuses, right? The problem is that we just didn't have the institutions to respond to that problem at that time, which is why during, the, during this period, you have what I call the great siloing, right, where organizations, the federally qualified health centers, for example, which in, initially were based on this South African, pre-apartheid South African model, of community-oriented primary care, where they adopted the whole neighborhood as the patient. That went away. They turned into medical care offices. They turned into doctor's offices. And they got uh, reimbursements from Medicare uh, from their patients, and that was it. And those of us who did community development, community empowerment, community revitalization, we became real estate developers. Um, and that's, we build affordable housing, and that's kind of how that sector worked. But that was clearly seen as, an, uh, by the 1990s, that was seen, even though some of these sectors merged and they got bigger and more sophisticated, um, and that certainly happened, what happened w w by this point was an, a, a recognition that no one sector alone could fix it. And you think about it, but, and I, 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 did, I did work in those days in, in, in that sector, in the affordable housing sector, and I remember we, we really thought that if we got the buildings right, we would solve poverty. We were convinced of that. Um, you know, the building got the buildings right, then the investment would come back, and the businesses would thrive, and the families would stay together, and the kids would do well in school, and you know, we just thought that was the theory of change, and it didn't work, right? Um, and that's when, um, you know, during the recession, it sort of laid that strategy bare, and that really put us looking for other partners, and that's when we started looking more and more to health, and so um, that. Uh, this is the 3.0 period. This is the collective action period right here where we're in right now where people are really recognizing that you have to be sort of 
you know, cross sector and all this work, and I'll, and I'll get into that. So here's the com comprehensive community development 2.0. This is I pulled this out of one of those plans. It had these kind of great. These plans are so again they they make a lot of sense. But as my friend Nancy Andrews, who runs the Low Income Investment Fund, would say, she called them. They said it was parallel play. I mean, w you know, people they came to the right place. You know, they came to the table. But when it, when things got tough, and they will get tough, uh, everybody retreated back to their silos. Um, so they were effective, but but not as effective as they could be. Here's the collective impact model. Uh, common agenda, common progress measures, mutually reinforcing activities, each expertise is leveraged as a part of the overall effort, communications that allows a culture of collaboration, and a backbone organization that takes on the role of managing collaboration. So the backbone, we call this in, the, in a book we wrote, um, uh, What Works, we call it the community quarterback. Now, the, now you read this article and you talk to them, and I, and I hope no one's here from FSG because I'm going to talk a little smack about them. But they. They have two preconditions for this, which are you need leadership and money. Right? Leadership and money, if you have leadership and money, you can pick five random things. These don't, these don't, you can pick five random things and you would be successful. That is not a strategy. Leadership and money is the game. Um, we did something similar. About the same time we wrote this book, um, Investing in What Works for America's Communities, you can see that um, at the URL on the bottom. You're, we're, we're happy to send you a free copy of that, or as many free copies as you'd like. One of my favorite lines of that, which I think is relevant to today, is a, a, in the essay that Risa wrote, where she says, we are likely to look back at this time and wonder why community development and health were ever separate industries. But we came up with a very similar sort of typology. We said any intervention that really turns places around, things like the Harlem Children's Zone, things like Neighborhood Centers Inc. in Houston, things like uh, the East Lake intervention in uh, Atlanta, they said they all seem to have these sort of elements. They have trust and buy-in from the community. You can't get anything done unless the people um, you, you're serving trust you. Um, they have to be cross-sectoral. We have to work across the sectors. That's pretty obvious. Being place-based is important because you have to sort of behave differently and act differently, and it, it helps to be really passionate about Harlem or um, Sharpstown or wherever it is that you're working in. You, that, that, that love of place is often really necessary. You have to be data-driven. You have to shut down the things that aren't working and, and reallocate resources to the things that are. And we call it the community quarterback, which is similar to the backbone organization. Um, we often, we, we made a, a similar uh, observation in our assessment of these successful uh, cross-sector interventions, and we said they also have these other two ingredients that in every case. You have to have a charismatic super genius who has a close friend who's a billionaire. <laughs> so that's the game, right? We're trying to reverse engineer the billionaire and the genius, and I think leadership is everywhere, and I am certainly, I got a chance to tour some and, and meet with some people yesterday uh, in Austin, and I was blown away by how much creativity there is here, and I see that in many places that I go. Not everywhere, but many places that I go. Um, and you've got a few billionaires, which is handy, but you also have, but there's plenty of money in the system. The money is not the problem. Um, I think it's the coordination and the business model is the problem, and that's why, and it, and it has something to do with fish, as you can see here. Um, and what it is, I think about sort of, um, is problem, coming back to that issue that we talked about before with, the, with the, the war on poverty analysis, that social exclusion is the product of many overlapping social exclusions. What, another way of saying that is, Poverty is a complex adaptive system. It's, it's the difference, between, it's like cancer. It's like every time you treat it in a certain way, it, it, can, it can adapt and, 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 and morph. Um, and so we don't yet have an ability to have the, where the solution set meets the problem set. That is where we are at today. We're trying to figure that out. I think, you know, army ants, T cells, artificial intelligence programs that have, you know, an, and, and consumers in a marketplace all have very simple decision rules that allow them to do amazingly complex things. Um, and these are, I think there is a market that sort of, if we kind of create, if we think about back to that trillion dollars, if you solve that problem, I think there's a market mechanism we could deploy that could be complicated enough that, that where people could just do their regular jobs and, but do it in a coordinated way that would achieve really remarkable ex results. Okay, so now I want to shift gears for a minute, and this is, this is something I just want to go through some very quick slides here about social determinants of health. Um, by the way, who here is a health person? Can you raise your hand if you're a health person? Oh, good. And how many of you are uh, like community development, affordable housing people? Great. Who, who else is here? <laughs> I'm just curious. Who are, academics? Transportation. Transportation, good. Economic development, Economic development important. Anybody else? 
human services, fantastic. All of this is important, right? Um, we're, all, we're all a fish in the school, in my mind. Uh, but, um, so, so real quick, health is not healthcare. So I, this has took me a long time, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, my husband is a pediatrician and he is a public health professor at Berkeley and I, it took me, I, you think I would have gotten this a little earlier, but I did not, it just took, it took me a long time. I, when I heard health, I thought medical care, right? Um, but it turns out that the things that really influence your health are not the things that happen in a doctor's office. And so here's this study, there are many studies of this type, but this is the one that Michael McGinnis did, and it shows that healthcare affects, in his estimation, this is the contribution to premature death. I thought it would have been access to high quality healthcare or, or bad healthcare is what killed you. Well, that's not true at all. It's these other things, behavioral patterns, social circumstances, genetic predisposition, environmental exposure. These are the things that really determine your health. And then, so if health is not medical care, what is it? Well, it could be education. Now, here's some slides I borrowed from the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Commission to Build a Healthier America. And you can see this is uh, life expectancy at age 25. This is for men. Um, and it's, it's measured um, by at, from age 25 uh, on. And you're, you can expect to live nine years longer if you're a college graduate than if you're a high school dropout. And I, you know, I am, I am almost turning 50. I am running out of decades, and if someone took one away, I would be pissed. <laughs> you know, so this is a big chunk. This is not a small, this is not a small amount of time. So here, these, these, these next two slides are both on uh, poverty. The dark green line is those who live under the poverty line. The next line is between one and two times the poverty line. The next line is two to three times the poverty, two, two to four times the poverty line, rather. And then it's four times the poverty line and, and above is the light green line. And the poverty, poverty rate in the United States is about $20,000 for a family of four. Um, and you can see that the percentage of children with less than very good health is 30% for kids living under the poverty line and only 6% or 7% rather for, for kids who are four times the poverty rate. So, so health is education, health is income. And this is a problem for all ethnic groups, by the way. So you here you see on the left is black, Hispan non-Hispanic, the middle one is Hispanic, the right one is white. And in each case, these are the same bars. Um, in each case, those who are living under the poverty line are reporting m much worse health than, than those in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, than in the higher income brackets. Now, this is one of those weird situations because it's a problem for all racial groups. Now, it's true that only one in 10 uh, white and Asian Americans are living in poverty and one in four black and Latino Americans are living in poverty. So this is one of those weird paradoxes where this has nothing to do with race and everything to do with race, right? So this is a real important part of the puzzle. And, it, and, 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 and what we find is that sort of these, these um, opportunities or these neighborhoods that promote health and those that deter it or detract from it are kind of a raid over space. And we, we've done these infographics uh, in different of these um, uh, uh, meetings around the country. Here's one where um, this was in the Minneapolis Fed and uh, the Minneap they uh, actually got some pretty good coverage from the local television station. And this is Interstate 95. You can see kind of dog legs there. And they did life expectancy by, um, by off-ramp. And, and even in Minneapolis, sometimes we'll, do, we'll, we'll have these maps in like New Orleans or Washington, D.C., you know, cities that kind of are famously have troubles, right? I mean, Minneapolis, come on, this is like the, this is, you know, this is a city that's famously well run, very high quality uh, local institutions, great education system. And, and, and still, in a place like Minneapolis, between these two, is that? Between these two, uh, three, three miles between these two off-ramps is a difference in life expectancy of 13 years. And you, you know, we had one of these for Austin, I'm sure we would see something similar. And, and so they, the, the television company went in and interviewed people from the two neighborhoods and they, had, uh, they were interviewing some, this guy from the low um, uh, life expectancy neighborhood and they said, what do you think about that? And he said, what do you mean what I think about that? I think I'm moving to the other neighborhood, is what I think. <laughs> So all of that really comes down to this concept that you've heard many times probably that your zip code is more important than your genetic code for your health. And that, you know, the reason for that is that the things that get under your skin are the things, you know, when you have opportunities and you have access to good schools, when you can eat a healthy diet because of your, of your um, you have access to good grocery store, I mean, it's fresh food at a grocery store, you have access to quality affordable housing, work, transportation, et cetera, that gets into the cells of your body. Um, and you live longer when you live in a neighborhood that provides those opportunities. Um, 
And that's really what, what a lot when you think about health and housing and you think about what you guys are doing, creating that sort of housing that really stabilizes families and stabilizes neighborhoods is really, in, you're kind of in the zip code improving business. So this is, I'm, I just have about five minutes left and I'm going to just talk about this market that values health. I'm just going to just brush over it. But um, basically, I think in a marketplace, you have buyers, sellers, and tool makers that connect the buyers to the sellers, right? And in, in my estimation, there are a lot of buyers in the market who are interested in uh, improving health. So I mentioned Kaiser Permanente. That's my health insurer. They're interested. They, they now, for example, they, have, they own all, they are, all the hospitals in the island of Maui. So they own, they own all the downstream medical care risk on an island that has higher than, even though it's a beautiful place, it has higher than the national average poverty rates and it has worse than the national average health outcomes. And that's a medical care, it's kind of a closed loop. And they are starting to talk to preschools about how can they improve the experience of early childhood uh, in, on the island of Maui as a way to save medical care costs. They're a buyer of health. I think a lot of hospitals who are worried about readmission risk if that persists, is something that will, they will be willing to pay some money to sort of buy better health outcomes. The federal government, the Veterans Administration, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, you find them in a position they were willing to pay for better health outcomes. Um, these population health business models where you get paid per person per year to keep somebody healthy as opposed to per procedure, this whole thing that the medical people call moving from volume to value, that they are becoming buyers of health. And they are looking for partners like the affordable housing industry to help them stabilize their, um, uh, their, their patients. You see uh, health insurance companies. United Health is one of, a real leader here. Humana is a real leader here. United Health is, has been buying, uh, um, has been investing in affordable housing here in Austin as a means of which where they see that as a strategy to help because they say our policyholders live in your apartment buildings. And so they see that as a really important strategy to help stabilize their policyholders. Um, you see foundations, uh, St. David's Foundation is a buyer of health. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is a buyer of health. These are places that are willing to spend money on a, on a better health outcome. And you also have, um, you know, the high net worth individuals are interested in this too. I mean, there are a lot of people who want to invest in their communities where they live or communities they care about. And they are willing to sort of, if you put it in this frame, are willing to make investments. Sometimes they can really make a, a reasonable return, but sometimes it may be a below market return, but they will definitely get their money back. And they're interested in being buyers of health as well. Now, who's a seller of health? Well, I would say Foundation Communities is a seller of health. If you've ever been to one of those properties and you see how happy those people are and supportive they are, people who are formerly on the, uh, on the, on the uh, outskirts of society who are really uh, struggling, now having all kinds of social support, they are better off and healthier than they were before. Um, you have, uh, you, uh, I think, a crossing guard who notices the little girl's hair is a little more disheveled, hasn't, hasn't, you see, you know, maybe there's, the clothes aren't clean, you know, could make it, could somehow alert somebody that something's going on in this particular household. She, th that crossing guard could be a seller of health. I think a big brother, big sister could be a seller of health. I think a police officer who's engaged in po community policing who really helps stabilizes a community, helps everybody sort of, uh, takes down the stress level in a neighborhood. That's a seller of health as well. The person who builds an affordable housing project, uh, the person who makes sure that a kid is reading at grade level, the number one most predictive factor of future health for a child is not their body mass index, it's whether or not they're reading at grade level, right? A teacher is a seller of health. And increasingly, you have these tool makers, they connect the buyers to the sellers, right? So you have, um, I really think that CRA motivated banks are tool makers. I think that community development financial institutions are, are tool makers. Those of you in here uh, who may have been, may be familiar with the strike fund uh, that uh, Housing Works and others are trying to put together here in Austin, that's a tool maker, that's a tool to connect people to affordable housing or reasonably affordable housing to stabilize neighborhoods, to stabilize families, that's a tool maker that's going to promote health. Uh, the social impact bond is a, is a, is a tool. The, um, any of these sort of population health business models and, and, and are, to, are, are tools that connect buyers to sellers in terms of health. So that, um, so we do, there are plenty of places where we can start connecting those buyers to sellers. Now that's a bigger concept than we have time for this morning, but um, 
but I, 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 I want you to start thinking about that because I think if you start organizing the, those of you who, want to, who have some resources to pay for a better health outcome, those who are able to deliver that health outcome, and those that can connect the two of them, that's kind of like the schooling fish, right? That's one mechanism where we think you can create a market is, is a complex adaptive system as well. And I think it is an example where you can have a, 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 where the solution set might possibly meet the problem set. Um, so I'm going to end on this. This is um, uh, the mayor. We met with the mayor yesterday, and he said, well, what city is doing this right? And the funny thing is that there's no one place that's doing it right. Some place, you know, San Francisco is probably maybe in the lead in terms of supportive housing. Uh, Seattle might be in the lead in terms of uh, connecting transportation to, 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 to low-income communities. Uh, you know, other communities might be really have a great school-based program. There, there are lots of places that have elements of it, but we haven't yet combined them all into one place. And that's why I'm so excited about this group and why I'm so excited about Austin, because you really do have uh, high-performing community-based organizations, high-quality local government, and, uh, and resources in a way that a lot of communities don't have. And I think you might be the place that has the breakthrough that brings all of these, these tools and pieces together. I, I love that we got a little, like, a little music interlude here as well. That's, that's, I hope that, sorry, Megan. Um, for, uh, these are a lot of complicated ideas. A lot of them are summarized on this website, buildhealthyplaces.org. Uh, um, if you're interested in following up on these, lots of those other um, uh, um, co conferences are summarized here that I mentioned, those 35 conferences. Um, and uh, that's it. Thanks very much for having me here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much to David Erickson because he did just a fabulous job of kind of setting the foundation for a lot of the conversations that are going to occur today.